Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. In a series called Christmas Unmasked, before I, actually, you know what, before I get started, I want to say something. I am so grateful for our pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. I just, the longer I work with them, the more I, I really come to understand and value their heart for you, pe- for you people, for all of us, <laughs> for you people, right? <laughs> but I am so grateful for their heart. And man, you know, they stepped out in obedience, 14, was it 14 years ago, 15 years ago and started this church. And I just, you know, there's a verse that says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has perceived what God has in store for those who will put their trust in him. And I just watched Pastor Marcus and Natalie and, and, and how they make decisions and how they choose what's You know, they they listen to the Holy Spirit, and I'm so grateful to be serving with them here at this church, serving under them. So, yeah, I just, thank you. I travel a lot, and every time I travel and go to different churches, I just come back here, and I'm like, what an amazing thing God has done right here in Seguin at Crossroads Church. You guys have figured it out. So, all right, so we're going to continue our series, Christmas Unmasked. Today, we're going to be talking about the Magi, and um, I got to be really honest about the Magi story. I've always had issues with it. (laughs) There's a bunch of stuff in there that you're like, wait a second. Why didn't you give us more details on that? Like, there's really weird stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, But we're also going to talk about today, you know, this whole series is about how do you respond when the light shows up? And he shows up in our world of darkness and it becomes, and he's so bright that we don't even know what to do with it. We talked about in the first week how there's two ways to, to blind someone. One is to turn off all the lights. Another one is to make it so bright they can't even see everything that's going on. They're just like, whoa. And I'm convinced that when Jesus came, it changed everything. Jesus showing up. And there's a reason we, we made time start a new date. You know, A.D. Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Because when Jesus showed up, the whole course of human history changed because the light showed up in our darkness and he's just been forever bringing more and more and more and more light into our world. And so it's this process of unveiling. It's like unmasking this brightness because we can't handle it all at once. We talked about that again in the first week. Like all these guys that have said like, Jesus, show me your glory. God, show me your glory. God always says, no, you can't handle that. It would kill you. So what I'm gonna do is little by little, I'm gonna let my light shine into your darkness. And that's why throughout your life, you learn more and more about God. And and the Bible is this inexhaustible source of truth that just shows itself to you in layers and layers. I've been hanging out in the church for 43 years. And I still, this week, as I was reading the story of the Magi, I'm like, I never saw that. Or maybe I saw it, but it means something different to me now because I'm in a different season of life. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But I want to tell you a story about something that happened. While I, For some reason, this story came to my mind while I was preparing for this message. Have you ever gotten into a situation where you go, whoa, this is not what I was anticipating and you were just completely unprepared for it? Anybody relate to that? So a few years ago, I was in China for four months, People's Republic of China, and a friend of mine, my friend Neil, he came to me at my little apartment I was at and he said, hey, there's this company that wants us to, to judge an English competition. Would you come and judge it? And I'm like, what? I'm like, okay. So I figure, you know, it's like, me and Neil and some other person, and we're just going to sit there and you know, a couple people will stand up and give their speech and we'll judge them, right? So I'm like, all right, whatever. So right as we're about to go, I mean, he tells me the day of. So right as we're about to go, I'm like, I guess I should probably wear jeans. You know, I am a judge. So I got dressed up and put on jeans instead of shorts. <laughs> and then um, I was like, I guess I should probably wear at least a collared shirt. I, am, I mean, I am a judge, right? So <clears throat> I went out and I, I got my, my, my polo shirt my like, little white polo, and I felt pretty dressed up. You know me. I don't like dressing up. You guys have seen it. So I was dressed actually a little bit less nice than this. <laughs> well, a van showed up and picked us up, and I'm like, wow, that's a nice van. All right. So we're driving along, and we pull up to this giant, giant um, uh, building. It's huge, like multi-level building, and they escort us in. All these people are escorting us in, and they're walking us, and they're like, can we help you with anything? Can we get you drinks? And they take us to the top of this building, and at the top is this beautiful paradise. It's like this, it's like a biodome. It's, it's like we're in, in this job. I'm like, this is wild. What is going on? And they're like, okay, thank you for coming. Uh, when you come, here are the rules of the competition, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, 
wow, this is like a lot different than what I was expecting it to be. I thought we'd show up, you know, be a couple, couple people there. And, well, then they take us back in the van and they drive us to this huge auditorium. And when we walk out of the van, there's all these people taking pictures. It's like the paparazzi. Like there's this, there's a red um, runway carpet and we're all walking out and I'm like, I feel like I'm a rock star. But he's like, I'm like, I'm like, shoot, I guess I should have dressed a little nicer. <laughs> then we walk in and this auditorium is packed with people like dressed to the nines in suits, tuxedos. It was like, like the Academy Awards or something. And I'm like, walking in in jeans and a polo shirt as the judge. And they escort us to the front. When we walk in, the whole place rises and claps for the judges. I'm like, whoa, this is not what I was expecting. So then we get there and we sit down and, you know, all the people are like, we, we all have our own private attendant. They're like, you, you need anything to drink? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And they, Would you like some green tea? No, I'm good. I'm good. So I'm like, man, I'm like, Neil, we are like, we are, I wasn't ready for this. He's like, I didn't know it was going to be like this either. Well, then the speeches start. And I'll never forget this one lady. She got up. Some of the speeches were horrible. I couldn't understand a thing they were saying. If that was English, I don't know what it was. But I'm like, you're not winning. So, <laughs> but there were some of them that were outstanding. And I'll never forget one of them. She got up and she's like, the secret oil pipeline between China and Kazakhstan that no one knows about. And I'm like, I turned to Neil. I'm like, are we supposed to know about this? <laughs> like, what, if the, what if they go out and kill us now that we know it's top secret? So it was the Chinese National Oil Company we found out that we were judging the English competition for. <laughs> I'm like, he's like, she just said, did she just say that's top secret? I'm like, yeah, should we call the government or something? Like, we should we call it? <laughs> Anyways, this whole time, I just felt completely out of place. And I was like, I wish I would have at least, less, at least dressed nicer, you know, been a little more respectable. But man, they were just like, oh. And, and what, what stood out to me was, you know, the reason they needed me be, was because I spoke English. That's what I had. And they brought me there because of that. And just my presence there is what they needed. They needed somebody who, had, who spoke English. It wasn't that I was super educated or talented. Um, at the time, I don't even think I'd finished college. Or, anyway, but here I was judging this Chinese national oil competition. It felt way out of place. Now, you're like, where, where's he going with this? It's Christmas. What is he talking about? Here's where I'm going with this. <clears throat> I know that everybody in this room, we've got something in our lives where, where you're sitting around right now and you're kind of looking at it and you're going, this is nothing like what I thought it would be. Maybe you were expecting this Christmas to be with that loved one who passed away. And it's, you're, you're looking around and you're going, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. They've been with me all these years. Some of you, I've talked to some of you even just this morning, that you've been, you find yourself raising kids. They're not your kids, but you're raising these kids and you know that you're supposed to be raising them. But you're going, man, this is not what I thought it was supposed to be. I thought we were supposed to be retired by now. And, but instead, we're raising kids again. Um, some of you are looking at your job situation. You're like, this is not what it was supposed to be like. Like I had this vision in my mind of what it was going to be. And then what it actually turned out to be was way more than I expected it to be. We've all got areas of our lives where things just get overwhelming. Where they get, it's just, we were, we're like, man, I'm underdressed and unprepared for what I just got into. And I, don't, I don't literally mean underdressed. I mean, you feel like you don't have the tools it takes. And you feel like you don't have the prestige it takes to pull off what you feel like you're supposed to be, you, like the role you've been put in. Anybody relate to that? We just get overwhelmed. Man, and something about Christmas it just really comes heavy on us. Uh, I don't know if it's the end of the year, but for me, it's, I think it's just the end of the year and looking back and going, oh, there's a bunch of stuff I wanted to get done that I didn't get done. So I'm always kind of chiding myself for that. And when that happens, what we tend to do is, is some of us, we resort to just checking out. When you just feel overwhelmed, you're in a role, you're just like, I can't even keep up. This is not what I thought it was going to look like, and I can't even keep up. We just check out. For some of us, checking out means just binge watching the TV all the time. That's what you do. You just come home, you flip on the TV, pop open some adult beverage, and you just sit there and, until, you can, until the sun goes down. You're like, okay, now I can go to sleep, right? You can't go to sleep when the sun's still up. Well, some of you can, right? Some of you... Uh, it comes in as depression. You're just like, this is so depressing. This is not what my life was supposed to look like. I, I didn't think it was supposed to look that way. Um, for others of us, it just leads to just perpetual feelings of insecurity. You're in a role at your job that uh, 
you're, you're already insecure about your ability to pull it off. So anytime anybody questions you, you, you like do these, all these weird insecure things. And, um, and you know, everybody knows you feel insecure about it because you do these weird responses to it and you lash out. Maybe some of you just turns to anger. You're feeling angry all the time. When we all come to this point where we feel like we're completely out of our league. We stepped into something that was nothing like what we thought it would be. We thought it would be one way. Our expectation was one thing, and then we got into it, and it was com- something completely different. There's a, there's, a, a Christ- there's a part of the Christmas story that I look at, it, and as I read it, I see these guys got into something that was way in over their heads. It's the story of the wise men. If you know the story of the wise men, we're going to look at it this morning. The Magi from the East. It says this, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, a little background on this. Very likely, these guys came from Babylon or Persia, which was in the east. And if you remember, the Jews were in captivity in Babylon and Persia for many years, hundreds of years there. So they probably, these wise men had probably picked up on some of the prophecies of the Jews. And they figured out, oh, this king of the Jews is born. So they're like, and this, is, this was traditional protocol back in the day. If the king, if next to you, the, the, the uh, country next to you, a king is born, you go bring gifts to that king. Like, hey, this is the protocol. You go shake some hands, here's some presents. Don't invade us when you get older. You know, keep the diplomatic relations going. So this is a standard thing. They're like, okay, the king's been born. There's this, this star, right? So, so it says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So they show up to Herod and they're like, hey, where's this king that's been born? And King Herod's like, whoa, hold up. A king's been born? I didn't know about this. And they're like, they're probably thinking, where's, wait a second, we came here for this king and King Herod doesn't even know the guy exists. Very weird. It's not what they expected. They thought they'd just show up, shake a few hands, hand off some gifts and head back their way. But they walked right in the middle of a diplomatic issue, right? A problem. And so when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, this is Herod, he's like, hey, who's this king that's supposed to be born? He asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. So then Herod called the Magi back. He's like, hey, guys, hey, guys. He secretly, at secretly, and he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He's like, so you say a star showed you there's this king that's born? Like, I'll tell you what, here's what I need you to do. It says he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for this child. As soon as you find him, let me know so that I too may go and worship him. Now what you got to understand is Herod was a very insecure man. He had through manipulation, domination, and just plain conniving, worked his way up to be a king in that area that the Romans allowed to stay in his authority because the Romans ruled the whole area, but they said, if you keep taxing these people heavily and, and make sure you send the money back to Rome, we'll let you stay in charge here. So he was terrified that somebody was going to take his authority. All of a sudden, they walk in and they've just, the, the Magi find they're in the middle of a political struggle. And they didn't know it, a political struggle between a little baby and this very insecure leader, Herod. So here's what happens. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went out ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you guys know I'm honest that when there's a part of the Bible that I don't like or understand, I will be honest about it. I'm not the kind of preacher that goes, this is what the Bible says, I believe it, and that's enough, right? Right? Deep down, I do believe it, but sometimes I'm like, that's a little implausible. <laughs> and it's okay. If you're that way, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, I'm like, I don't understand what's in here. That's okay, because here's, here's the, the, the power of the Bible. It is full of truth. And just because you don't understand something now doesn't mean you may not understand it eventually. But the truth doesn't go away. So we have to conform ourselves to the truth. And this story is very uncomfortable to me. First of all, here's some problems I have with it. First of all, the star apparently disappeared and then reappeared. What? How does a star disappear and then reappear? I have a problem with that. Sorry. 
Second of all, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother. So basically, this star shows them right over the house. Now, that's a cool picture to paint. Look, a star. There's the house. Oh, everybody's happy and found Jesus. How in the world do you find a single house based on where a star is positioned in the sky? <laughs> Honestly. Can you imagine if I gave you directions to my house? Yeah, it's just above Mars. Danny said, that's because they were wise men, and you're not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was good, bro. <laughs> OK, so they're wise men. But honestly, I mean, that's a weird thing. Like, how did that happen? So I started researching this. And um, there's a couple of theories on this star, right? First of all, they, they say that you know, the, the, the Greek word that they use is aster. Some of you, you, you teaching nerds are going to love what I'm about to share, okay? But those of you who are like, just tell me the point, stick with me, all right? The Greek word they use is aster, which is actually a luminous body in the heavens. That's where astro comes from. And a lot of people believe that what it was was a comet. But that's pretty much been debunked because they're like, no, nah, a comet. They would have known what a comet was, you know. But what they think it was is, is there are two possibilities, there was one time in 2 BC, in June of 2 BC, when Jupiter and Saturn crossed each other's paths for a period of several days and became so bright that it was just like, it was like a clear sign in the heavens. Anybody that was watching would have been like, whoa, that's a bright star. So they think that may have been what's called a conjunction, where two planets come together for a amount of time. Um, the only problem is that only happened once, and it was in June. So that may have been the first star, which interestingly enough, Christmas does not happen in June. Christmas happens in December. I believe part of the reason for that is because people, we shifted to December because you know that in just a few days is the darkest time of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. And I believe that it was symbolic for the idea that, because Jesus probably wasn't born in December, but it's symbolic of the idea that in the darkest night comes the brightest light. So. Just a little historical tidbit there. There's another possibility that Jupiter and Regulus, one of the stars, crossed. And this happened twice. It happened once in two B 3 BC and once in 2 BC. You remember with BC, they count backwards up to zero and then they count forward. So it's possible that it happened in 3 BC. They saw the star. And, and that's the other thing. Is like, it's not like they saw a star and then jumped on a Delta flight to come to Jerusalem. They had to trek over miles of desert. So it took them a while to mobilize, get the gifts together, get a plan, and then walk across the desert. So it's quite possible there was this conjunction of these two stars that happened. They saw it in 3 BC, and they're like, it's a sign, it's a sign. It goes away, so they start heading east, or they start heading west, and then the star reappears. Now, how did they find it over the house? I don't know. That's a question we'll have to ask when we get to heaven. I don't think it'll matter by then, but that's what's happening in the story. But what I think is fascinating so much about this story is that these guys got in way over their heads. In fact, it says here, after having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod because God knew what Herod wanted to do, they returned to their country by another route. They didn't even get to go home. They didn't go back through to see Herod and tell him what's up because God showed them. Can you imagine what that'd be like if like, all of a sudden you realize, man, that guy didn't respond quite, that king didn't respond quite the way we thought he would to us coming to see this new king. They're like, man, I think we're in a little political conflict here. And then on top of it, an angel shows up and says, you are in a political conflict. Don't go back to that king and tell him what's up. Just go, go home. So these guys were kind of in over their head, and they figured that out. They showed up to judge an English competition, and it was way more than they thought it was. <laughs> what I think is fascinating is right after this, an angel shows up to Joseph and says, Joseph, I need you to flee to Egypt because Herod's about to go kill all of the children in that vicinity that are under two years old, which is what makes us think that it was a two-year process between the time that, that the Magi saw the star and that the time that, the, uh, the, that they came. And what's, what I thought was really fascinating, I had never seen this before, is you know traveling takes money. And Jesus and his family were not wealthy. They were poor. They couldn't even get themselves a room in the inn. And isn't it interesting how everything they needed for their flight to Egypt and to move, pick up and move and immigrate to another country as refugees was provided for them by these wise men who brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those were highly, highly valued gifts. In fact, they actually had some symbolism to them, um, those gifts. 
The, the, the one symbolism for it is that it, there was gold for a king. So there was a symbolism that you bring gold representing that Jesus was the king of the world. The symbolism of the frankincense was a high priest. Frankincense is what they burned in the temple. And the high priest before Jesus, before Jesus, you could not go directly to God. You had to go through a priest. And you had to go to a priest and say, um, you know, I, I, I've sinned. Will you sacrifice this lamb for me so I can be right with God? And that's why the difference between Protestantism and, and, and what, what Catholicism has tr traditionally taught that's one of the big differences, is what's called the priesthood of every believer. Boy, we're going deep theologically today. The, the priesthood of every believer is this idea that you don't need somebody to go to God for you. Because of Jesus, you have direct access to God. So you're saying, man, I just, if I could just have a pastor pray for me. Yeah, that's fine. Ask a pastor to pray for you. But know this. God is not mad at you anymore because of Jesus. You can boldly run to the throne of grace. Just you and all of your insecurity and all of your feeling like you don't have what it takes and all your feeling overwhelmed, you can run straight to the throne and go, God, help me. And he'll scoop you up right where you are because of Jesus. And this is what is representing what Jesus would be. He would be the one that because of Jesus, you can go straight to God himself. You don't need a priest anymore. You don't need an intermediary you have direct access to God. And that's really encouraging because there are some times at two or three in the morning where you're just feeling overwhelmed. You're stressing out about what's coming ahead. You don't have to go listen to some preacher on TV. You don't have to call up the pastor. You don't have to call up your counselor. You can go straight to the Lord himself because of that. Myrrh was representative of, of sacrifice. That is what they used to embalm the different body, to the bodies before death. So there's this element of these gifts that they brought representing what Jesus was throughout his life. But you know, there's layers to everything in the Bible. The Bible is a story of God's interaction with humanity. And the Christmas story is specifically the story of what happens in people's lives when Emmanuel, God shows up, God, God with us, shows up in our lives and how people respond to it. So I think the message for all of us that we see from the Magi is when you get into a situation where you feel completely overwhelmed, you're like, whoa, this is not what I thought it was gonna be. I thought life was gonna be completely different. I thought by now I'd be at this far along and I'm not there. I thought I'd have this knocked out by now, but it's not done. I thought I'd have this beat by now, but it's still not beat. I thought I wouldn't have this addiction. I thought I'd have the money I needed by now. I thought I'd be over this hump. I thought I'd be out of this depression. I thought I'd be over this anxiety. You're feeling overwhelmed. You're like, this is nothing what I thought. Here's the best thing you can do. This is what the Magi did. Bring your best and give it. Woo, that's good, Joel. I go back to that English competition. They didn't ask me to come in because I was so good looking. <laughs> they didn't ask me to wear a suit. All they said is, we need somebody who's got what you've got. Come in and do this for us. And I know for a lot of you, you feel really inadequate, insecure, incapable, and you're like, I don't have the skills, I don't have the talents, I don't have what it takes to do what's in front of me. I feel overwhelmed right now. I don't know how I'm gonna make it without him even being around anymore or her being around, you know, the, the loved one that passed away. I don't know how I'm gonna raise these kids. This is not what I thought raising kids was gonna be like. I don't know how I'm gonna face this illness, this sickness. I didn't, this isn't what I bargained for. Here's, here's what I think we learned from the Magi. When you find yourself in a situation that looks nothing like what you thought it would, bring your best and give it. Because a lot of times what happens is, you know, with the story of the Magi, we focus on, on the presents they brought. Everybody's like, it's all about the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But I kind of wonder if the more important thing was their presence, was the fact that they actually took the time, made the effort, and showed up. That was an effort for them to get there. You know, the... The shepherds, they were just down the street in the fields. These guys had to pack up their, their camels, their donkeys, their horses, whatever it was, work their way across the desert and, make it, and then show up and say, we're here to recognize that a king is here. And we thought he would be in a palace. He's not. He's in this little shack. It's nothing like what we thought it would be. We thought we'd be shaking hands with emissaries and emperors and, and kings, but instead we're just hanging out with poor people. But here's our best gifts. And there are certain roles in your life that only you can fulfill just because of the nature of who you are. And some of you feel inadequate as a parent. And so what you do is you spend more time at work. 
trying to bring in money because you're like, I feel capable there bringing in money. I can get my kids money. They can get all the stuff I never got growing up. They can go to all of the, the competitions and the sports games and the, you know, whatever it is that you're into. But really what your kids need is your presence. So you're focusing on giving the presents, the money, all the stuff. But really what they need is, is your presence. And I think that's the beautiful thing about the Magi is they made the effort to cross the desert and come and just be present. Sometimes you're, dealing with, you're, you're handling somebody who's really struggling emotionally and you're like, I don't know what to say. I don't know the right things to say. Well, then don't say anything. Just be there. That's good. That's right. I don't know how to deal with this grieving aunt of mine. She should be over this by now. Yep. Just be there. Bring your, because your presence is what's most important. And, and, and listen, only you can be the father to your children. Only you can be the mother to your children. If you're in a role of stepfather, you have been placed in that role for a very specific reason. So step up and be that role. If you're a grandfather raising your grandkids, only you can play that role and step in in that role. But your presence is the most important thing. And even if you feel inadequate, not up to the task, tired, worn down, just be present. And I believe that's the message for this season that we get from the Magi. We get so focused on the presence. What we need to focus on is the presence, being present. So I want to throw down a challenge today. Here's my challenge. I want you to sometime this week, between now and Christmas, maybe on Christmas, create an intentional time for total presence with those around you. Now I'm really going to make this hard, okay? Y'all ready? Some of the stuff I'm going to ask is going to seem impossible but I think you can do it. <laughs> Create an, enti- a time, an intentional time for total presence. So that's what this could look like. Turn off the TV. It doesn't have to be on 24-7. Just turn it off. Yeah, but that's how we bond. We bond. We'll figure out another way to bond. Turn off the TV. Second, turn off phones. And this is hard because when you're in a conversation, you're like, oh, remember that movie? And look at, have you seen this meme? And we end up turning on our phones and what happens is the conversation dies because we went and showed that meme and then you're like, oh, Joe, Joe texted me. You ever notice how that happens? I'm talking lock the phones up, even if it's only for two hours and do something that requires you to engage and be present together. Say, man, I don't know, I don't know that, like, how to create conversations. Hey, listen, I've got some great, a great advice for you. Best five bucks you'll ever spend. Right now, if you go get a kid's meal at Chick-fil-A, the prize that comes with it is this little box of discussion questions you can have with people that are really fun. Five bucks. Go get it at, at Chick-fil-A and you'll get fries and a drink too, right? And, and, and nuggets. But it's got questions like, you know, what's, what's got you most excited in life right now? Is one of the questions. Like, what a great question. Get conversation started. Basic stuff. Pull out some old photos. Get out those old photos that you're like, man, I've been meaning to sort through those anyways. Get those. And, 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 and you're like, kids aren't going to be interested in that. They've got phones and stuff like that. You'd be shocked. Paper photos? Man, people just start drawing around and going, what's that? Is that me? Who's that? Play a board game. It's not B-O-R-E-D game. B-O-A-R-D game. Get a game that'll get people engaged. And then ask some pre-planned questions to get the conversation going. That's where that Chick-fil-A thing will come in handy. If you go to Chick-fil-A... You can't go today, it's closed, but Monday morning, first thing, get a kid's meal and get that little thing. Elise and I love going through those questions, but my encouragement for you is just, man, take some time to be really intentional this week because the hustle and bustle of getting everything ready and trying to figure out everybody getting there, figure out a time you're going to carve it out. And and listen, you're going to get some pushback. People are like, we don't want to do that. You say, listen, mama said it. If you don't do it, right? Maybe you need mom to throw down the hammer here, but... Make some intentional time. Don't let this year pass by without taking some intentional time to show, hey, I'm here for you. I know my phone seems to take a lot of my attention, but I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to be here for you right now. Turn off the TV, turn off the phones, and just spend time with the people you love. And just see what happens. You might be amazed at what happens. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.